All right. Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us today. I think um, today we we have met today to review one of our books, and the title of the book is Spirituality. But we want to engage the author on 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 the content of the book and why he thinks um, the book is very important for such a time as this. And we do appreciate you for joining us to have that discussion. So um, as the discussion is going on, if you have any question, you can type it in the Q&A if you are using Zoom. For those of us in, in on Facebook too, um, you can just put your question in the in the chat and then we'll pick it up and address it. Um, my name is Jeffrey and um, I'll be doing this review together with Catherine and we will engage the author, Reverend Kennedy Oredu. So um, thank you for joining us and we do appreciate your time with us. We hope that this one hour will be very productive and your life will never be the same. But before we start with anything, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for such a time as this, as we have met to discuss your inspiration that you gave to Reverend Kennedy to write this book. We pray that uh, the rationale and the reason becomes clear to us. Not only we understanding it, but applying it to our lives, even for the glory of you alone. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. All right. So, so thank you once again for joining. And actually, I mean, a book review is sort of um, an academic exercise as as well. So we review in that aspect also, and then we also want to understand why why he wrote the book. But this session is actually from the Parisia Commission, and um, just to give something brief about about this this commission, um, we are just a group of um, young Christians, and what we want to do is that we have a vision that we reach out to all Christian youth all over the world, and the the way we want to do that is to empower them through prayer, through the Word of God, through worship, and also mentoring. And the word parousia is actually a Greek word which simply means boldness and in the state of boldness or being confident sometimes in, when you, you you need courage especially in intimidating situations you have to come out to exhibit some sort of confidence and boldness and in, in the bible you are going to see this word in hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 you are also going to see this word in acts chapter 4 verse 31 so um, it is about facing challenges. We don't um, have the view that there are no challenges, but the view that we hold is that we can face those challenges and then we are going to do what? Overcome them as we come to know Jesus Christ and his saving knowledge. So um, this group is actually founded by Reverend Kennedy Oredu, the same author that we will be engaging today. And we also have three patrons. One of we have Reverend Professor B. Y. Kwashi, Reverend Dr. J. Nenodonko, and Professor Kusia Anidu, who are our patrons. So they guide us in whatever thing that we are doing. So that we don't, you know, we don't veer off and do whatever thing we think is right. So um as as you are here with us, we also have volunteers and executives or committee members who are helping us with our programs. I think um, this year we have had a number of programs and people volunteer to help in organizing this. People do come participate through music, some on music, some on prayer, some on word, general meetings and all those kind of things. So this year has been very, very much fruitful. We had, I think, one Facebook Live earlier in, I think, um, Q1 there. And then we are ending it with today's session on the review of the book. So we encourage you, you can support us, volunteer, partner with us, and, and be, be with us. So when we say Paris, yeah, the, the response is for the love of Christ. So um, that is um, briefly about us. And um, without wasting much time, I think um, we can bring in the author and then Catherine um, so that we we... We might continue with that discussion. And again, 
thank you for joining. If you have any question, kindly put it in the chat box or those of us on Zoom, you just put it in the Q and A. We will just pick it up and and address it. So um I'll just I'll just start with my question. I don't think I have many questions. So um so first of all, Reverend, and thanks for joining us and thanks for writing out this book. Um, I've gone through some for some time and I think it's really encouraging. But from your side, um, the first thing I'll pick is why this topic? I mean, maybe why this title? Let me put it that way. Why did you choose the title Spirituality? If you can share with us why that, that was the title you had, yeah. Yeah. Jeffrey, thank you so much for this opportunity. And Catherine, thank you also for being here. Um, I'm also grateful to the entire Parisia team, to the chair of the committee, uh, Sister Vera, and everybody on the executive committee for the great work we are doing. Um, this question goes back to the very beginning of Parisia, as you talked about. Our focus on the word, the teaching of the word, worship, mentorship, and these key aspects of what God, we feel God has called us to do. When we had our first program as a commission, we the theme for that program was, this is our confidence. And one of the decisions we took as a commission was the fact that we want the teaching of the word to remain thoroughly and, and our our participants or those who who are part of this commission to constantly have the teaching, the, the perspective, our perspective of the word readily available to them. So a long time ago, the executive committee took a decision that anytime we hold a teaching program on the word, we will make sure that we put it into writing. In other words, making the word of God available in various formats. So we video record, we audio record, and then we also produce a write-up of the message that is taught. And so after the inaugural program, which is This Is Our Confidence, the next major program we had was that spirituality. And when we did This Is Our Confidence, the, book, the booklet was also produced. Maybe another time we'll review that one. But spirituality is actually the second born, the second product of, of, of Paresia Commission. We had that program at Kaneshi Presby. It was an awesome program. And it was a worship theme. It was undergirded with a worship theme. I remember it was on that day that our music department, the PIW, Parisian and Worship, we, we launched our two songs, two maiden songs, the Parisian Anthem and then another worship, Presby Medley. So it was that same day. And on that same day, we touched on the topic of spirituality. So the subject of spirituality was key because we're focusing on our worship and understanding our worship beyond merely singing and lifting hands and singing choruses to God and even maybe becoming emotional about it, but coming to our worship from a deeper perspective. And there are several passages in the Bible that could speak to this theme. But I've always admired Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, because that encounter is seriously packed. It's packed, it's charged with politics, it's charged with religious engagements, it's charged with philosophy, and it's charged with, with worship. And that often you would think that Jesus will hold such a power-packed engagement with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are the scholars. But Jesus, and they are the religious leaders. They are those who are right there. But you have Jesus engaging in this deep conversation with an ordinary woman who is even a Samaritan. And through this book, we invite fellow Christians and followers of this commission to revisit that conversation and look at what is happening there because a lot is happening 
beneath the conversation that is happening there. And that is what we try to unpack when we, we come to these booklets, which is titled Spirituality. You will see how the conversation begins on the ordinary issue of give me water to drink. And it ends somewhere around, I see that you are the, or you're a prophet. The whole connection, the whole journey of the conversation. The point where at the end now, the woman runs to the town and says that, come see a man who told or who has told me everything about myself. And she comes back with the whole town. And Jesus stays with the Samaritan village for about a day or two or so. And souls are worn. So it's a wonderful engagement there. And I believe that that chapter, John chapter 4, it's the most, for me, the most epic um, revelation of this subject of spirituality. And that is what drew my attention and focus to this particular chapter, and hence the writing of this particular book. Thank you. Uh, all right, all right. Okay, so so th thank you. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, my last question for now before Catherine comes in. Uh, so over in, in reading the book, I noticed that um, you 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 commit to going back to share something on the two kingdoms and um, so this question is like two in one first of all why do, why did you think it is it was very much significant to go back there and as individuals who study our bibles how do we develop this thing into kind of seeing something in the new testament but why is there the need to go back to trace the source and try to link it? And how do we do that? So actually, I'm giving you three questions now. <laughs> I thought I was just giving one. So the first one is, um, why did you do that for this particular book? And then the second one is, why is it important that when we are generally reading our Bible, for here we see something on Samaritan. I'm sure when you go to somewhere Hebrews, you see things on the the priestly sacrifices, the high priest, how he is called. Well, those are not in the New Testament. Why is that important? And then the last question will be, why, how can we do it as we take our Bibles to read? Yeah. So those are my last question, yeah. but three, three, one question. Yeah, really, yeah. really packed questions over there. <laughs> yeah. If I leave out anything, you can draw my attention to it again. You know, well, I think my, my basic training as a Biblical scholar always draws my interest into finding out the background of a text. So naturally, whenever I pick any text, um, per my raising and my um, academic studies, I will always want to look or find and research on the, the historical background of what is happening because the text of the Bible always have a background there's always something happening behind the text sometimes we are we are told sometimes we don't know sometimes you have to go and find and search and discover but secondly beyond just the academic exercise over and over i think we undermine or we we downplay jesus's um, actions and movements in the new testament in our time i think we constantly downplay some of the things Jesus um, did in the Bible and in his generation. And it will take you to have a historical background to come to realize that this simple statement or this simple action that Jesus did or said has huge implications. And the thing is, Today, we may read a verse or a passage or a parable of Jesus or an action of Jesus today. And when we look at it with our, our modern um, eyes, our modern lens, we don't see the weight in what he said or in what he did. Like the parable of the good, uh, the, no, not the, yeah, like the story of the good Samaritan. Jesus would have been stoned by the Jewish people for saying such a parable. Unless you have an idea of the background, you will not see the trouble he's causing with that simple parable. And I can remember, or I can state several other parables or statements or actions of Jesus that without taking a look at 
what is happening beneath the text, you miss out on a lot of things. And this is exactly the same thing with the conversation with the Samaritan woman. And that is why I felt the need to go back to the Old Testament and trace the impact of what is happening. It is when the disciples came to meet Jesus with the Samaritan woman, you should read their reaction in, the, in, the, in John's gospel. Their reaction was not positive. They were shocked. They were amazed. And I'm sure some of them have been annoyed because first of all, Jesus regarded as a Jewish leader, a teacher, is not supposed to... Women in, in the generation, in their time, were regarded as... Um, how do I put it? You, you don't regard a woman to such an extent as to even teach or educate her. Moreover, a woman who is a Samaritan, and Samaritans and Jewish people did not have that good friendship or that good relationship. So when you look at pages four, I think it's in those pages, pages three to four of the booklet, that is where we capture a brief history of the relationship between the people of Judah and then and the Samaritans, how far back they go and how their political enemies, their religious enemies, and all the levels of enmity between the two. And yet Jesus is able to engage a Samaritan, and not even a Samaritan male, but a Samaritan woman, is able to engage her on such an important subject. So when you read the four, page four, five onwards, it, it highlights the depth of conversation. It enriches and it helps you appreciate what is really happening in the text. How do we also do it? I think that every Christian, every child of God, preacher or teacher of the word should endeavor to seek and to find and to research. Today, by God's grace, due to um, internet and go to Google and you can always search out for Bible commentaries and other Bible helps that can assist you read a bit more background information on the various aspects of the Bible. So it's key that you spend time. You no, know, don't just read and know I've read, it's gone. But spend time with the text. Look at the text carefully. Pay attention to the movement of the text. And you begin to unearth, you begin to re unpack the deeper things that are happening within the text. So that is what I will share, Jeffrey. interesting one there and I think I like the drawing the line between the northern and then the southern kingdom here as well and then the real um, title of the book spirituality brings us to one key issue where we always have problems with being religious and being spiritual and I think um, in on page three you, you did indicate that this was both that is the discussion between Jesus and the Samar um, Samaritan woman, was both a spiritual and a religious question. So then somebody will ask, what is what, what does it mean to be religious and what does it mean to be spiritual? Uh, can you throw some more light on that for us? Thank you, Catherine. That's a very important question. And I would I would attempt a straightforward answer. Some way, some way, somehow, I stated it in the book as well. The key difference between religion and spirituality, as far as a Christian is concerned, for me, is that in religion, man initiates, man's initiative. In spirituality, from the Christian context, it is the acknowledgement that God has made the initiation through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the most important starting point. When anyone misses this starting point, it's like the foundation, all other things will fall apart. So there is no religion on the surface of this earth or religious teaching or religious nomination that it is that teach that God has initiated relationship with humanity. Christianity, as far as I believe I understand, is the only faith that makes the bold statement 
that God reached out to fallen humanity. And he reached out to fallen humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. And has henceforth established a relationship with us. Not any ordinary relationship, but relationship as our father. There is no particular religious faith that I think um, comes to that revelation through Jesus Christ. And so that will be one important line that I'll draw between religion and spirituality as far as Christianity is concerned. I hope it, it touches on the question that we are asking. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for bring, um, shed, shedding light on that. Um, I just want to push a little further on this religion aspect, you know. So my, myself, I have had it, um, this tri kind of differentiation. But I think when you read in the Bible, you are going to see where we are told about what true and pure religion is, I think, in James. James mentioned how true and pure religion is caring for the poor, the widows. How does that fit into this context? Because we are being made to understand that Christianity is not a religion, it's something different. That notwithstanding, in our in our sacred text, we see that word showing that religion is something that maybe God in quotes likes, but we are prescribed the way to do it, to care for the poor, the widows, and the orphans. So how do we differentiate it just in case this, this thing comes along, right? Yeah, you know, the key elements that define religion, and in this particular case, not just Christian religion, but any other religious faith, the key elements from, if I may say, from Islam to Buddhism to Hinduism or any other religion, the, the key elements are anchored on prayer. Almost every religious faith emphasizes prayer or meditation of some sort. Um, charity that is giving. Um, Islam emphasizes the importance of giving. Um, many various religious groups emphasize giving. You can talk about fellowship that is coming together, gathering. So in many other religions, the adherents of those religious faith, they gather, they come together, they, they fellowship. And you can add two more or so of things, but these, and there is always a text, um, there's always a religious book. Uh, almost every religious faith has a certain, a certain text. Christians, we have our Bible. Um, other faiths have their own religious text. So, and they encourage the reading and the reflection of these texts. So on the general level, any religious group or denomination who refer to themselves as a religious group anchor themselves on these four or five things. Prayer, charity that is given, a religious text that is um, adhered to or read or meditated on, and gathering, coming together. So when we talk about religion, that is what James was touching on. And when you read the book of James, James focus on the action of faith. You know, he's interested in the fact that we should not just be all about um, inward faith, but it should show in our actions. You know, and if you watch the definition of spirituality that I gave um, somewhere in the pages of of the of the text that of the booklet that we are reviewing, I define spirituality not just um, I said that, I think on, on page two, I said that by spirituality, I mean the quality of a person's holistic relationship and connection to that which is divine and the, and the consequent influence and outward evidence of that relationship on his or her physical life. So you see there is an inward focus that must yield an outward evidence. It is not so in the Christian faith, it is not the reverse. It is not the outward activity to yield an inward focus. It is not about 
I'm praying, I'm reading the Bible, I'm going to church so that I would show that I'm a Christian or show so that I would demonstrate something. No. But in the Christian faith, we say that based on the relationship that you have received with the Father, that relationship that has been established through Christ Jesus in the presence of the Holy Spirit, based on that relationship, based on that internal relationship that has been established in you, then prayer becomes a necessity. So prayer doesn't become a regulation. It doesn't become a duty anymore. It doesn't become a forced activity. It doesn't become something that your church pastor must force you or your mother or your father or whoever it is must. It doesn't become, hey, if I don't pray, I'll go to hell. It doesn't become, um, I feel like uh, if I don't pray, I've sinned. That is not what it becomes. Prayer then becomes a way of life because you are in communion. You are in a relationship. And that goes on with your giving, that goes on with your coming to church or your reading of the Bible. All these things become external activities that are built from or that, that grow from an internal event that has taken place. And so in Christianity, that is the most important, that is the most starting point. So th this is where we try to make it very clear. The internal the internal um, 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 evidence, the internal activity, that must result in an outward evidence. And that's what James will say that, hey, if you say you have faith and you don't take care of the poor, if you say you have faith and you you discriminate, if you say you have, you have faith and you are not fair, you don't treat people rightly, then he says that, hey, I doubt whether you actually have faith at all. So that is the issue that James is raising in his book. And that is what I think that we are also emphasizing in, 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 in the spirituality aspect. You know that Jesus asks the woman, give me water to drink. And if the woman says she's a woman of faith and Jesus is asking for water and she's blinded by Jesus being a Jew and she being a Samaritan and she goes, how come you a Jew? You are asking me for water. And that is where Jesus begins to punch hole in her spirituality to show her that you don't actually have spirituality. You have a religion. You are actually not connected. You are still blinded by by my Jewishness and your Samaritanness, if I dare say. If you are in true spirituality, it will not matter that I am a Jew and you are a Samaritan. I need water to drink. You provide me water to drink. Yes. All right, all right, all right. Th thank you. So so if I understand, all you are saying is that Christianity is not the outward because the outward is mere religion, but Christianity is on the inward and then from the yes. inward, it comes outside. Yes. All right. So, 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 so I'm getting the point when we hear pastors say Christianity is not a religion. Actually, that that is what they are trying to say. What they are trying to say is that it's not the acts that we do that is very visible that determines it. But the it it is as a result of something inward as that has by virtue of it being full, coming out, as Jesus was saying, the things that come out of us, right? Okay, all right, okay, thank you. So um, I just touch on um, some some other things that I, I I saw in the book, but still coming to this point of activities and um, the general the general thing, I think as, as, as young people and as young Christians, we also hear another word, oh, you are not spiritual. So if, from our understanding, the the outward is just by virtue of what is inside. When when we say somebody is not spiritual, I think generally we will go like, this person doesn't read the Bible, this person does not pray. How, how does that term actually come in? That when we say that, oh, you are not spiritual. What what are we? Should that be the case in the first place? And what should be the actual meaning for us to be saying that if we are even supposed to say that? Yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey, that is a very important question. And you are actually highlighting um, a danger, you know, a danger. A danger that um, we must tread carefully. Because when, as far as the Christian faith is concerned, yes, we are a body of Christ. And for example, we are Christians, we are a denomination, we may be Presbyterians, Methodists, Roman Catholics, and of various denominations. 
And often when we are so focused on the external and we lose sight of the internal activity, that is where the problems begin to arise. And as you are saying, people will begin to maybe judge other or their fellow Christians based on the fact that, hey, you are not prayerful, you are not. Jesus himself was judged by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They said, hey, you, you don't fast, your, your disciples don't fast like us. They were looking at their external activities. They were saying, hey, your disciples don't pray like the way our disciples do. They don't do this like that. And based on those things, they were um, maligning Jesus. They even went on to say that um, Jesus is a glutton. He eats too much. He drinks too much. Because they were so fixated on the externalities, you know. And this is where um, we must put caution to. One, as Christian institutions, as churches, where we need to pay a lay emphasis on the spiritual build-up. Often I feel that we are so focused on the external factors to the neglect of the spiritual build-up of the person. I have said somewhere that we can have people go through the routine of church activity and church events and they may be empty within Somebody can be so meticulous with coming to church. Church starts at 8 a.m., 7.45, he or she is there. Um, she sings, he sings, he, everything. But the whole thing can just be like what he says did when he saw the fig tree. Leaves, no fruit, external leaves. And where we end up in these things, then we realize that we have lost sight of the most important thing, building the internal capacity of the person nurturing the spiritual growth of the person through the teaching of the word, through the understanding of the word, and through the relationship, the relationship, emphasizing the relationship. I, When I was reflecting on this booklet, one of the best things that came to me, which I've, I, it has dawned on me so heavily recently, is realizing that God is our father. I think it is the greatest thing Jesus left for us. And I think it is the least reflected upon aspect of our Christian work. The fact that God is our Father, that relationship. And I think that we have not emphasized that element of our spirituality enough as Christians, as children of God. And so you have Christians who don't know that God loves them. You have Christians who have no idea that God cares about them. You have Christians who have no idea that their life is in the hands of God and God cares and God orders their steps and God is there for them. And so many Christians are left, they will come to the church, all right. They will come and participate, all right. That is for those who want to show up, they want to keep up appearances. They don't want you to know that they've, but some have already quit church in their hearts. They just show up in appearance, but in their hearts and within them, there is no connection in, in these things that we are talking about. So, Jeffrey, I think that um, the, ex the focus on the external is, is, is a danger and it's a caution. If somebody says, hey, you are not spiritual enough, uh, I don't know what basis and what criteria the person is using to judge somebody that, hey, this one is not spiritual or something like that. But I think we must look deeper and we must look at key I issues as the scripture draws out to us here. Yeah. All right, thank you. So um just just um just before Catherine comes in, I'm just um so should maybe young people, I, I think normally young people really go through this. You see people who oh, you are not spiritual. I don't know, but personally or as a commission, are we do we have an avenue for people like that to Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody is concerned about me. Everybody hates me. How I, um, we might, something brief, but I'm just looking at, is there an avenue for such individuals in the commission such that we commit to reorienting them and making sure that these unworthy thoughts of, of, of God is, is actually dealt with so that they 
put on their real identity and work in, in boldness or in Paris. I think, yeah. I think that is exactly what we are doing. This is this is what we are doing. Exactly what we are doing. Um, putting out these messages, having such discussions like this, um, the programs we organize, the booklets we have published, and all the efforts we are putting in to get that message out there. Because at some point in time in my life as a young person, I was at a, at a stage where I didn't know or understand these things. And my my Christian faith, my being a vegetarian church member, did not, I was in the youth group, I was in the choir, and I wasn't yet, it's like Samuel being in the house of the Lord, and he did not know the Lord. He was seven in the house of the Lord under Eli, and he did not know the Lord until he had that encounter, that that experience. And that is what I think this commission is doing. We are playing that, if I dare say, that signboard role, raising the alarm, drawing the attention that um, as young people or as Christians, as believers, we we should we should we should not be caught up with the churchiness. You know, we should not be caught up with the 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 mere outward church things. That we should seek the deeper um, um, aspect of what all that is happening. The beyond the ordinariness, there is there is a spiritual move of God. There is God who is behind all the ordinariness that we see. And so you are right. We are doing our best. Maybe as God leads us. We will continue to create other avenues and reach out to more and more places and hopefully get this message out there in addition to all other place people who are also pushing this kind of understanding. Yeah. So pray with us and keep supporting us. Thank you, Reverend. So, so those of us on on Zoom, we are saying that you can still put your questions in the Q and A, please. And those of us on Facebook, you can put your comments in the your questions in the comment places, and then we are going to pick it up and then and then speak to you as you are aware. This is from the Parisia Commission, and we are reviewing our book Spirituality. We are just primarily getting deeper into the mind of the author and some things that the book brings along. So I just go to, um, so two things, um, the, the the Bible versions, is there any specific reason why you selected the, I think I see the message Bible strongly represented in the book. And then um, yeah. I think the new, the new IV, TNIV, or, or, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, well, in, in um, any, any, know... You know, when we were putting this book, when I was writing this book, and as we do, we we try to have the youth in mind. And when I say the youth, I'm looking at um, SHS, even JHS, all the way. So if you see, for example, we took the decision that this book is not supposed to be a lengthy book, but we could go, um, we could go 100 pages talking about spirituality. But we decided to make it brief to to engage the attention of the young person. The diction, the grammar, we try to keep it to a certain level so that the GHS person can read and understand, the university person can read and understand what is being communicated. And that also connects with the Bible version as well. So a message translation, for example, is one youth-centered Bible version. The NET and an NIV have very... A simple approach to the text. If we go to other versions, things get a bit more complicated, a bit more complex to understand. So I I was attracted to these versions for simplicity, for easy reading and easy understanding of what the text is communicating to us. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So um, in that same John 4, I'm just picking on um, if you check the book page two because of the version i needed the version to come in before i ask this question in in page pages two and three we see the message bible giving us idea of god's way of salvation 
God's way of salvation is made available through the. So I just want to pick on the idea of salvation, how we can link uh, salvation with um, spirituality, and then yeah. So if you can, if you can help us, help us with that, because it seems God is having a way of salvation. But salvation in general, how do we link that to uh, spirituality? Yeah. Let me take you to that page where I painted on the aspect of God being our Father. You know, we talk about salvation and spirituality because the relationship that we must have with the Father, the cannot exist outside Christ Jesus. Right from the Old Testament, when we read the book of Genesis, when you, you understand the, the freezing that happened in the Garden of Eden and how the relationship between the first human beings and God was broken. And you then realize that all through the entire Old Testament, we see that God's relationship with human beings is broken. And the priesthood will attempt all forms of sacrifices to, to keep us closer to God. The day of atonement, when the priest goes into the most holy place to offer the sacrifice and he comes out with the blood of the animal and sprinkles it on the people. And the people celebrate because for a year, their sins have been forgiven. What does it mean? It means that God will be in their midst. And if God will be in their midst, then they are assured of victory. If God abandons the people, they are not assured of victory. You see? And it comes to the point where we understand that without Jesus Christ, there is no starting point to spirituality. I, I talked about the holiness and the nature of God as beyond infinity. And there is no amount of good deeds that one can do to say that I am trying to connect to God by doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I'll reach God and connect to him. No. And that is why God himself came to us in his son Jesus. So anyone who denies the salvation that Jesus has brought, automatically denies his or her spirituality. You automatically relegate yourself to religion. And when I talk about religion and spirituality, like over the week I was communicating with a group and I shared, I, I give this anal analogy to them that it is like having two laptops and one laptop has internet connectivity and the other laptop doesn't have internet connectivity we can all be sure that the laptop that has internet connectivity or even the mobile phone that has internet connectivity can do a lot more than a mobile device or a laptop that doesn't have internet connectivity. That is exactly the same way I see the example between a human being who has no salvation. There is no spirituality to a human being who has salvation there is connectivity. Once we come into Christ or once Christ brings us into him, and you remember what he, he says, you know that one of the things I said, that the, the, in fact, the whole focus of salvation, I, I have said this statement, it's a bit bold, it's a bold statement, but I, I say it with some evidence that the drive of salvation is not even the cross. The cross is the journey. It's part of it. But the end point of salvation is the Holy Spirit coming to live in you. And that is the activation of the spirituality we are talking about. The Spirit of God. He is the definition of spirituality. It is the Holy Spirit who is the definition of what spirituality really is. So um, um, if, 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 you, if you neglect salvation, then... You can't even start talking about spirituality. You are you are left. You are you are like a, a laptop or a mobile phone without internet connectivity. Yeah. 
Thank you. Catherine, do you want to? I think uh, maybe one of the things, the whole essence of this review is also to get us to read this book if we haven't read it. And so we are teasing your minds as we go along. And to think that a simple question of give me water to drink will lead us to a whole spirituality um, journey is an amazing one. And one of the scriptures that really touches my heart when Jesus he says, but the time is coming. It has, in fact, come when what you are called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. And we are in an era of the de de denominationalism. People's churches matter where they attend church matter to them so much. And, and Reverend, what do you have to say to such people? Sometimes we tend to overlook it and say they are not mature, the things, but people are making so much fuss about where they attend church and to the extent that they even look down other people. Twenty-three. Yes, Reverend. What do you have to say to us? So I totally agree with you. Um, it's a sad situation because you have you have said it exactly as it is. These are the things that uh, unfortunately still occupy our minds and our attention. We, if we go into details, um, people will see where the, the if I quote unquote the attack is. But that is the issue. Jesus made it clear to the woman, when what you are called will not matter, and where you go to worship will not matter. You see. <laughs> and you see, this is where, for example, the historical background will, will help one see what is happening here. Because when, during the time of King Rehoboam, the kingdom was divided into two, and you have 10 tribes going to join Jeroboam. And you have only two tribes that were left, left for the descendants of David. So the two tribes became Judah. And then the 10 tribes that left to join Jeroboam, they became Israel under Samaria. One of the things that Jeroboam did, one of the abominable things which God hated that he did was that he thought in his mind that these 10 tribes who have come to join him, if they still go to worship in Jerusalem, they would at some point in time turn against him and his dynasty. So he decided to build an altar of worship in Samaria so that the 10 tribes will no longer go up to Jerusalem and worship there. And so for the next uh, millennial for the next centuries to the time of Jesus and the Samaritan woman talking, the altar that Jeroboam built in Samaria existed. And that is the woman raised that question to Jesus about you Jews say that Jerusalem is the only place of worship. She was making reference to where they also worship. And she was making the argument that Jesus, we also have a place we worship. So you Jews are not right, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus just said, hey, it, the time is coming and it has now come. It, what, it will not matter whether you worship at Jerusalem or you worship at wherever it is. It is no longer about the physical location of where you worship. You see? And there and then Jesus demystified the whole, or he debunked the whole idea of religion and drew attention to the spiritual state of the person. He drew attention to himself. And as I said, if we start applying this statement to our current time, you will realize how today, as you said, we are occupied with this is my church and this is um, this person's church and we go about with this is what um, the right practice and this is what we are occupied with. Them. Well, I, I will not maybe for the sake of we are online now, I would move away from certain statements. Yeah. But the point is clear, and Jesus said it as it is. It doesn't matter anymore. Those things don't matter anymore. If one does not have a relationship with the Father, 
and those things don't matter. They are empty. They are nothing themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe before we go to the if people if people have any questions, I am going to ask one question. It's not really in the book, but it tilts towards what we are discussing a bit. I heard the statement about somebody made a statement. I've been thinking about it anyway. It says God is not a Christian. Mm. Mm. What do you think of the statement? God is not a Christian. Yeah, we can even push it further and say Jesus was not a Christian. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we can push it further and say Jesus was not a Christian. This is a big question. I can answer, but it, it, let me let me try. If you are talking about Christianity as an institution, as an institution, then I can even say Paul and Co were not Christians. As an institution, because from from Christian history. Christianity as an institution actually began from the third century or the latter part of the second century into the third century. That is when Christianity itself started as an institution that we have today. Jesus and his followers and the disciples, one of the, I'm trying to see how I can make this clear. But one of the ways that maybe I can try and explain this is um, our our brothers and sisters in the Methodist Church sometimes have this discussion, and it's uh, similar to what we are talking about. The question is, was John Wesley a Methodist? Did he die as an Anglican? So John Wesley was an Anglican. Hmm. So it is one of the questions that we, we hear discussions that go on in the, in the Methodist circles. And the other question is, is, is Luther is, is, um, is Luther a Lutheran or is he a Roman Catholic? Did he die as a Roman Catholic or he died as a Lutheran? You see, Lutheranism started after Luther himself. So was he a Lutheran or was he a Roman Catholic? This is like the chicken and egg kind of discussion. Sometimes it looks like it. But we, we, we see Jesus as one who has come to fulfill the promise of the Father, fulfill what has been said. It is not about institution. So I concur on so many levels of that statement that Jesus was not necessarily, he wasn't part of the institution. He, he's about the life of God and about the spirituality and about having a relationship with God. You know, and that comes to the point when we say that God is not a Christian. And you know, it will shock if you go to, if we, we we end up in the end time and Christ comes and I dare I dare put it in this way that people that we may have categorized that these people are belonging to this religion, to that religion, if we find them in heaven or we, if we find them among the saints, why are you to go and who are you to go and ask God that God, why are you bringing these people also in? He, he judged their <laughs> spirituality. And per their spirituality, you, we sit somewhere and we say, oh, we are Christians, we are this, we are that. You know? And it's the same thing that happened to the Jewish people. Jesus came and he told them that you are sitting here tagging yourself with titles and institutions. And people that you think that God has neglected them, they are bypassing you into the kingdom. Jesus said that to the Jewish leaders. You see? And so, and that is what happens if, as an institution, you are caught up with external realities or external things. You end up focusing on institutions and external things, and the spiritual element is neglected. And so, yes, God is definitely not a Christian. He's God. And Jesus is not a Christian. He's Jesus. As it is. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just to add up, uh, of course, the primary reason for having a Christian and those who follow Jesus. So we can't say God is a follower of Jesus. In, I don't know how we are going to understand that. So <laughs> probably we, 
<laughs> are going to use I, I mean I'm just speaking the literal understanding and oh, make it yeah. quite simple oh, yeah. to hear because yeah. if you're Christian yeah. and somebody following Jesus, then obviously Jesus God, Jesus. <laughs> we, God is following we, Jesus. We, yeah, <laughs> we, we can we can't yeah. address it that way. But um so so thank you for being with us. Um we have had I think having this discussion for over 50 minutes now, and um actually we we have we have received um, two questions, and those two questions, some way, somehow, have been answered. I think the first, the first one was, um, "What are your thoughts on the very popular saying that Christ Christianity is not a religion?" And I think um, Reverend did answer it by saying that religion is mo mostly on on the outward, but because Christianity focuses on the inside out, not on the outside in then we have every right to say that Christianity is not a religion. The only thing is that now we have a reason why we say that, not to say outward things are not important, but we are saying that outward things are not the means to being spiritual. The opposite rather is true, because if it is full inside of you, it comes out. And I think um, maybe I'll, I'll let Reverend touch on the second question, which is also similar. So we talked about when people make comments like, you are not spiritual. And I think the 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 question is trying to see if we can get into the minds of people. He's saying that you are not spiritual. Do people say this as a measure of carnality or not expressing the fruit of the spirit? So even though the question is like this, we can also, if you can help us to, how can we encourage people when we see them as not bearing the fruits of the spirits what them. should we say rather pray than uh -huh, so that yeah pray for them pray for them pray for okay them. pray for them don't sit on the judging seat pray pray if you genuinely believe that uh, you see somebody in, in a certain state a christian or a child of god then instead of sitting on your high horse and wagging your finger and judging that person that way you are not spiritual and things like that there's a lot of danger in that. If you are the spiritual leader of the person, maybe you are the pastor of the person, or perhaps then you have an extra responsibility of spending time with the person and talking with the person and all that. But on any general level, I will always say pray for that person. Pray for that person. That is it for me. Yeah. Okay. Um. So um. I think. All right. All right. So so um. Just for all of us on the call. I mean, we. I. I believe if for nothing at all, we have a different perspective. If we see that the fruits, we supposedly see that the fruits are not coming out of somebody. The best thing is to pray for the person, and um, I think our, our time is up. What do we 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 do appreciate your time with us, and then what we also know is that these discussions normally goes on sometimes on our page and sometimes on our program. So if you want to be posted on our activities, I think we are on Instagram, Parisia Commission. We are on Twitter, or now X as Parisia Commission. You're also on Facebook. I think those on Facebook Live you are seeing. So we'll put the links in the chat for those um, on the Zoom call. You can like it and follow us so that you'll be kept posted on that. And we can actually continue the conversation from, from those social media handles. We also have our WhatsApp page. So we are going to quickly put that on the on the on the chat box so that um you can like, like and follow us. But um all other things being equal, we do appreciate your time. I think this year you have been with us from our general meeting to our program on um, salvation prophecy at um, Kanda. We went to Joulu. We also came to the um, Gan Presbytery head office to have our boldness conference. I think um, generally it, it has been wonderful. This year has been super with you and you have been with us on our last program. So we also want to get feedback from you. So through the link, anything that you have, just give us your feedback. And we also encourage you as we come up somewhere 2024, as we go on with um, activities and any other thing, we encourage you to 
help us and let's push this thing across to ensure that as many people come to the saving knowledge of, of Christ and then also work in boldness. We have put the link to the book in the chat so you can download it and read it read it well um, i think facebook too will be placed there so thank you so much reverend please do you have uh, something for us as we close out here yeah. um yes as you said uh, we are encouraging that we should read a book let's continue this discussion on our platforms yeah i think that's what i'll say thank you all right so okay so thank you very much let's pray Father, we thank you for such a time as this. We thank you for bringing us together to understand spirituality. Father, we pray that this should be the beginning of something that we are doing to truly understand our work with you. We also pray that you make things clearer to us and much more. Let us commit ourselves to living whatever thing that we have heard today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And have a good evening. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye. Amen.